Part 3. Pirates of the Mediterranean 20. Dark Forces May 26, 2010 began like so many other days in the Gaza Strip. That morning, jets from the Israeli Air Force soared across the sky, bombed the ruins of the Yasser Arafat International Airport in southern Gaza and a Hamas training camp in the north of the coastal strip, and left 22 civilians wounded. The same morning, Israel's then-government press office director Danny Seaman blasted out a sarcastic email to virtually every credentialed foreign press correspondent working inside Israel-Palestine. The email subject read, GPO Recommended Restaurant in Gaza. In the body of the email, Seaman provided a menu of the Roots Club and restaurant in Gaza. We have been told the beef stroganoff and cream of spinach soup are highly recommended, Seaman wrote. There is also the possibility of an enjoyable evening on the Greens Terrace Garden Café, which serves eclectic food and fresh cocktails. Thanks to the Israeli siege of Gaza, around 80% of the coastal strip's residents subsisted off United Nations-supplied food aid, while the overwhelming majority struggled with food insecurity. The blockade had spawned a black market economy that enriched a tiny minority that controlled the business of importing goods through the smuggling tunnels from Rafa, Egypt. Without the tunnels, the Roots Club and restaurant would have had little food to serve its customers. But in the era of Hasbara, none of these facts mattered to Seaman. With his press release, he mocked both organizers of the Gaza Freedom Flotilla sailing from a Turkish port toward Gaza with five ships full of humanitarian aid and those for whom their aid was intended, the caged Morlocks forced to take an appointment with a dietitian, as Israeli former government aide Dov Weisglas put it. But Seaman's email backfired. Members of the International Press Corps instantly leaked it, generating a wave of derisive and indignant blog posts from observers of the crisis. On the day of Seaman's email, the Israeli government leaked details of its preparation to deploy lethal force against the oncoming flotilla. Israeli army officials discussed the plan exclusively with Hebrew-language media, essentially concealing it from the foreign press and ensuring an audience consisting entirely of Jewish Israelis. The army's intention appeared to be instilling the Israeli public the fear of a terrorist naval onslaught, thus preparing them for a violent confrontation at sea and a potentially rancorous aftermath. Ma'ariv, one of the four major Israeli newspapers, first reported the details in an article titled, On the Way to Violence, One of the Boats is on Its Way. We are afraid that there will be a terror attack by the boats, an officer described as high-ranking, told Ma'ariv. If terrorists have gotten on the boats, or if there is an intention to use hot weapons, guns, against our forces, we will use full seriousness and caution. We want to avoid using force, but as soon as there will be danger to the life of our forces, we will be forced to use live fire as a last resort. The raid strategy, according to Ma'ariv, had been approved by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Minister of Defense Ehud Barak, and the commander of the Israeli Navy, Admiral Eliezer Marom. An aid ship, piloted by Palestine Solidarity activists, had successfully skirted Israel's siege of the Gaza Strip in August 2008, causing no repercussions beyond the jubilant celebration of nearly 10,000 of Gaza's desperately impoverished residents who were waiting on shore for the ship's arrival. In 2009, the Israeli Navy intercepted aid ships at sea, without any resistance, and the international media yawned. But this time, the Israelis were confronted with a flotilla comprised of five ships. The lead ship, an old cruise boat called the Mavi Marmara, was led by the Islamist Turkish aid organization, IHH, which was closely linked to the Justice and Development Party of Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Israel's relations with its only ally in the Muslim world a diplomatic connection that David Ben-Gurion spent untold stores of energy to establish and nurture, hung in the balance. The Mavi Marmara was loaded to the gills with hundreds of activists from around the world, including political leaders of the Palestinian citizens of Israel, 
who wanted to demonstrate their solidarity with those quarantined inside Gaza. Passengers on other boats included the famed Swedish novelist Henning Mankell, members of the German Bundestag, and British Parliament, the 85-year-old Melkite Greek Catholic Archbishop of Jerusalem, a one-year-old child, and a Nobel Peace Prize winner, Mared Corrigan Maguire. The evening of May 30th began in serenity for the activists on board the flotilla. As the Mavi Marmara chugged ahead on calm seas, some of its passengers argued politics on the bottom deck, while others laid out prayer carpets and performed the Muslim Salat. Everyone seemed to be enjoying the balmy Mediterranean evening. But the passengers' pacific mood was tinged with nervous anticipation. At 10 p.m., an Israeli naval commander called to inquire about the route of the ship. Gaza, the captain informed them. An hour later, according to Sumeye Ertekin, a Turkish television correspondent, the captain and crew decided to reverse course, turning the ship away from Israel. But even as they retreated, the silhouettes of destroyer boats appeared on the horizon. By 4 a.m., fourteen warships surrounded the Mavi Marmara. They followed and approached gradually, Ertekin recounted. At the time, the ship was in international waters more than ninety miles from the shores of Israel. Just minutes after the morning call to prayer began for the ship's Muslim passengers, the Israelis began their attack attempting to storm the ship from Zodiac attack dinghies. In February, before flotilla became a household word, I spoke to Huwaida Araf, a key organizer of the Gaza Freedom Flotilla, about her expectations. Araf was an Israeli citizen, a Palestinian Christian, educated at the Hebrew University, the University of Michigan and American University's School of Law, and had served as program coordinator for Seeds of Peace, the U.S. nonprofit to bring together young Israelis and Palestinians, endorsed by President Clinton. She was confident that the Israelis would back down and allow the boats through the blockade rather than attempt a potentially catastrophic raid. Ertekin said the Mavi Marmara passengers felt the same way. They thought that Israel could not do anything to such a large fleet, composed of people from fifty different countries. According to them, Israel would eventually let us through to Gaza. They had assumed that Israel, despite its record of leveling disproportionate violence against unarmed civilians, would behave rationally and not treat a few rusty boats as an existential threat to its national security. Now masked commandos from the elite Shayatet 13 unit were rappelling onto the top deck of the Mavi Marmara from Black Hawk helicopters hovering overhead. As activists gathered on the deck, the Shayatet commandos sprayed them at random with beanbag rounds and live bullets. Early in the day of the Israeli raid on the Mavi Marmara, some members of IHH's leadership gathered with a large group of passengers to discuss plans to resist any possible attempts by the Israeli Navy to board the ship. They decided that if the moment arrived, they would defend the ship at any cost. As soon as the Zodiac boats filled with commandos came within yards of the ship, Passengers pelted them with bottles, forcing the boats to retreat. While pulling away from the ship, the commandos fired live bullets at the passengers, the first volleys of the attack. Black Hawk transport helicopters were approaching as well, filled with more members of the Shayatet 13. Now groups of men on the Mavi Marmara scrambled to the top deck with homemade weapons, from chains to iron bars, waiting for the soldiers to descend. From the helicopters, soldiers fired potentially lethal beanbag rounds and live bullets at the crowds below, hitting several activists, including one who died when a beanbag shattered his skull. When the commandos scaled down to the ship from ropes, they opened fire almost at random, immediately killing two men, including one at point-blank range with a shot through the head. Some of the activists rushed to the top level of the ship with clubs they had fashioned from the ship's railings, using them to batter the commandos as they rappelled onto the deck. Once they managed to disarm the soldiers, the activists took them inside the ship for medical treatment. Photos smuggled out by a reporter from the Turkish daily Hurriyet revealed the expressions of sheer panic that had washed over the faces of the captured commandos when unarmed activists led them into the bottom of the ship. Though the commandos were stunned, none were seriously harmed. 
In fact, those who were injured in the clash received immediate attention from medics on the ship. But the soldiers' captivity exacerbated the violence, prompting other members of Shayatet 13 to accelerate the shooting spree they had begun. As the melee intensified on the top deck, a 19-year-old Turkish student with American citizenship, Furkan Dogan, sat alone in a room in the galley, listening intently to the sound of combat, to gunfire popping, to the pounding of feet sprinting across the top deck, and to the guttural groans associated with unbearable pain, Dogan agonized about his next move. Should he join the other men on the top deck, he wondered, even if it meant his death? Would he be killed anyway, even if he stayed in the galley? Dogan opened his diary and wrote what would be his final entry. I think there is not much time left for that moment of martyrdom. Is there anything more honorable? If there is, it should be my mother. I am not sure of that either. Which one's better? My mother's compassion or dying for a noble cause? Everyone has left the room now. I can see a serious expression on everyone's face, so serious that I have never seen anything like this before. With distress sirens blaring across the halls of the ship, the teenager made his way onto the upper deck, armed not with an iron bar or an oar, but a small video camera. He found himself in the middle of the fracas, with commandos spraying a fusillade of bullets at the activists assembled on the deck. Bullets immediately struck Dogan in his leg, left foot, and his back, causing him to crumple to the ground in pain. He lay there for several minutes on his back, in a pool of his own blood, dazed but conscious, while a massacre unfolded before him. At some point, an Israeli commando advanced toward Dogan, placed the barrel of his gun against the youth's face, and fired four times, killing him execution-style. It was a bloodbath, recalled Sumaye Ertekin, a Turkish journalist who traveled on the Marmara. The floors were like a slaughterhouse. I saw people whose internal organs were out. Ibrahim Bilgen, a 61-year-old Turkish electrical engineer and politician, met a similar fate. Immobilized by bullets fired from an Israeli helicopter, Bilgen was executed by a commando who fired a single shot at point-blank range to his head. Three other crew members were killed by gunshot wounds to the head, including Jevdet Kilichlar, a Turkish photographer who had jury-rigged an elaborate system allowing journalists to broadcast from the ship despite sustained Israeli electronic warfare. Kilichlar was killed while taking pictures. Then the ship's online livestream broadcast went dark. The killing continued even after crew members announced through the ship's loudspeaker that resistance had ended. Blood was pouring out of the bodies from their heads, Lubna Masarwa, a Palestinian-Israeli community organizer, recounted. An old man was brought in who'd been shot in the head. He was lying on the floor, dying. There was nothing we could do for him except hold his hand. Hoping to slow the soldiers' killing frenzy, Hanin Zoabi, a Palestinian member of Israel's Knesset, fashioned a sign reading in Hebrew, We have surrendered. We are unarmed. We have critically injured people. Please come and take them. We will not attack. When she displayed it before a group of commandos, they pointed laser-guided assault rifles at her head and ordered her to vacate the area. By the time the shooting finally subsided, nine activists lay dead and dozens were seriously wounded. Meanwhile, on the Sophia, a rusty old cargo ship accompanying the Marmara as part of the Gaza Freedom Flotilla, the commandos attempted to herd passengers to the bottom deck as rapidly as possible. Someone who was going too slowly immediately gets a stun device fired into his arm. Henning Mankell, a passenger on the Sophia, who was also an internationally famous novelist, wrote in his diary. Another man who was not moving fast enough is shot with a rubber bullet. People who have done nothing are being driven like animals, being punished for their slowness. As soon as the Israelis gained control of the Marmara, they rushed to the ship's kitchen and gathered up all of the knives they could find. Then they laid them out beside kafiyas, Korans, and any object that might convince the average Western news consumer that the flotilla was in fact a covert terrorist convoy. 
As the soldiers followed apparent orders to prepare the groundwork for a massive propaganda campaign, Masarwa noticed that letters written by hundreds of children to children in Gaza were on the floor, under the soldiers' boots. I realized that we must not be human in the eyes of the Israeli soldiers when I saw them joking with each other, one of them was petting his dog, after they had just killed innocent people in cold blood. Seven hours later, passengers were taken as prisoners to the Israeli port city of Ashdod, where they were interrogated and jailed. We are taken on shore and forced to run the gauntlet of rows of soldiers while military TV films us, Mankel wrote. Right beside me a man refuses to have his fingerprints taken. He accepts being photographed, but fingerprints? He doesn't consider he has done anything wrong. He resists and is beaten to the ground. They drag him off. I don't know where. Having stockaded the flotilla activists, the Israelis proceeded to the next phase of their mission, robbing passengers, including credentialed journalists, of their cameras, laptops, and recording equipment. Credit cards and other valuables were taken from many passengers, including Mankel. The Israelis intended to exploit the footage they had seized in order to establish a narrative that portrayed themselves as the true victims. SD cards and videotapes containing footage shot by passengers, including scenes Dogan and Kilich Lar may have recorded of their own killings, were thrown in a giant junk heap, ensuring that the most damning and disturbing records of the attack would never see the light of day. Back in Tel Aviv, some soldiers used the credit cards they had stolen to cover the tab for beery nights on the town, while an IDF officer was arrested for selling as many as six stolen laptops to lower-ranking soldiers. An army spokesman took to the media to denounce the scofflaws as soldiers who don't know what their uniforms represent. They would be the only Israelis prosecuted for their role in what a United Nations investigation would later label the arbitrary and summary executions on the deck of the Mavi Marmara. As the world turned its attention to Israel's massacre on the high seas, and the Israeli government threw its Hasbara machine into high gear, I boarded a flight from the United States for Ben-Gurion International Airport in Lod.